you sat here before the month of June. Yep. And you sort of declared for us. You laid out the numbers. You laid out the, the matchups and said, this is it. And now, as it stands, we've hit the break. And they are at their low water mark relative to 500. So we have our answer, do we not? Yeah, we do. And by the way, shout out to the St. Louis Cardinals. I appreciate what the Cardinals did yesterday with their front office, making it very clear to their fan base what they're going to be doing and declaring we're trading players. Like there's no delusion going on in St. Louis. They they know that 2023 is not going to work out for them. I appreciate that model and that method of telling your paying customers of what to expect in the upcoming weeks rather than finding out from a Bob Nightingale Sunday column in the USA Today because that's how we're finding out information regarding the Chicago White Sox. But the five players right now to pay attention to in the next couple of weeks, and this is where I think we're going to be busy at Sox Machine and also here in 670 The Score to talk about these breaking news, White Sox trades. Obviously, number one is Lucas Giolito. The only thing that's going to impact Giolito's market, Dan, is where are the Angels because they have lost 13 of their last 17 games. And if they continue down this downward spiral in the American League West, suddenly Shohei Otani becomes available. And if Otani becomes available, all the resources teams could possibly use to convince the White Sox to trade Lucas Giolito will suddenly shift over to how do we get Otani. Uh, the other pitcher to pay attention to if San Diego decides to sell is Blake Snell. But right now in the open market, Lucas Giolito is the top starting pitcher available. You got Keenan Middleton. He's a free agent after this season. Joe Kelly's a, there's a $1 million buyout for Joe Kelly. There's a $1 million buyout for Lance Lynn. Kendall Graveman, I have fifth on the list. He does have a guaranteed contract for $8 million in 2024. So if any team does trade for Kendall Graveman, you're not only getting him for the rest of the 2023, but also the 2024 season. That might be attractive for some teams, but those are the five names, and they're all pitchers for the White Sox that I could see Rick Hahn unloading before the trade deadline. I'm always kind of sheepish about return, and I wonder if you can help me out with this. When I'm, If I'm a White Sox fan and I'm saying I want Rick to maximize return for Lucas Giolito, what's in the realm of possibility for that maximization because it is someone who is out of contract after this year. Yeah, any team that acquires Lucas Giolito is getting him for August, September, and theoretically the postseason, if that team that acquires Lucas Giolito makes the postseason. So you're looking at three months of service. I think what the White Sox need, and you already saw one move this week where they acquired a minor leaguer from Kansas City to help boost their, their pitching depth. If I'm Rick Hahn, obviously you're going to try to get the best prospects possible but they need more pitching depth even though they drafted more pitching depth just this week they need more pitching depth so i would be targeting who is your best starting pitcher in double a right now because in 2024 the only two pitchers that have guaranteed contracts for the white Sox are dylan cease and michael kopech everybody's got buyouts or there's this mutual option so you really need to start loading up in pitchers starting pitchers that could possibly help you in 2024 on the cheap, because as we know, starting pitchers are not cheap. They're very expensive. And even the guys that you pay $12 million, $12 million for, uh, they're not very dependable health-wise. So if you need 150 innings from guys, I would start looking and asking for your top starting pitchers out of your farm system. Are you picking up the $12 million option on Tim Anderson? Well, it's 14 and a half because I just looked this up. Tim Anderson... For the hitters that are qualified for the batting title, is currently a negative 1.1 war, according to fan graphs. Ladies and gentlemen, he is the third worst position player in Major League Baseball. Only Enrique Hernandez and Jerickson Profire, Profar have worse wars than Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson's weighted runs created plus is 43, which means he's 57% below league average. That is the worst in Major League Baseball. He is the number one story I'm paying attention to the, in the post-All-Star break because if his play does not pick up in the second half of July and in August and September to where it's a little respectable, gives you faith that, okay, he's turning a corner, maybe you pick up that option. If he doesn't, Lawrence, and this trend continues, if I was hired as a baseball consultant for Rick Hahn, I would advise him, you buy him out. 
you give him his million dollars because for this type of production, you can find a shortstop for three to four million dollars. And if 2024 is just going to be like a reload year, you got plenty of middle infielders in AAA to fake it at the position as you aim to be 60 and 102 in 2024. That's how bad the situation has gotten. Like my tune before the season was, I think Tim Anderson's going to have a bounce back year. Look at all these contracts. Everyone's signing for the shortstops at free agency. He's going to be motivated. Maybe the White Sox should think about a contract extension with Tim Anderson. And here we are on July 13th. And the conversation is, I don't even know if you pick up his club option for 2024. It's gotten that bad. Your colleague, Jim Margulis, yesterday, posted a piece about Pedro Griffol and the difference between word and deed. And it was a a, a very fair, very even-handed, and yet immensely unflattering piece on Pedro Griffol. Not so much in that he's incompetent. It's just that it doesn't really matter what he's doing. And for him to still be saying... A lot of empty buzzwords about culture and talking about things are getting started or laying the groundwork and all of this as they continue to play bad baseball. The conclusion being, I believe he said something to the effect of he's he's not a con man. He's not the bag man. But, but he's, he's left holding the bag. He's left holding the bag. I, I We keep speculating about what he's got to think about what did I get myself into What should I have asked? What didn't I know about what was fundamentally wrong with the White Sox? Well, he's that's how he got the job, though. He told Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams what was wrong with their team. That's how he got this job. And unfortunately, whatever he told them, uh, no adjustments are being translated onto the field unless his pitch was, I know how to fix Luis Robert. That's and working. And I'm not sure that he's the one who fixed Luis Robert. Right. It reminds me a little bit of, of what we say about Billy Donovan, where it's great to be able to see what's going on and identify what the issues are, but you're in charge. Right. Manage. Yeah, and uh, it's gone reverse. So whatever he told him during the interview process, that this is wrong from my point of view, from the Kansas City bench, like this is what's wrong with the team. This is how we're going to address it. And now you're... 38 and 54. You're 16 games below 500. We're we're looking at a 70 and 92 win loss season. Maybe if you're lucky, if you could get to 70 wins, that's not fixing what was wrong, Pedro. Now, Now you're reversing course. And I don't know. I just feel like there's a disconnect. Like there's what Pedro says and there's what you are seeing on the field. And I just see a lot of disconnect. So I know Pedro's talking about the foundations are being placed. I know we're not winning games, but we're working on culture. I get a lot of White Sox fans that say that's loser talk. And in a way, yeah, it is. Because that's a lot of the things that the White Sox were saying about Robin Ventura when he was managing. Yeah, the three hours that you guys watch, things are not going so well. But you should pay attention to the other 21 hours. Should we? Because whatever he's doing off the field is obviously not influencing results on the field. And this is a results-oriented business. Do or do not. There is no try. So if you're not winning games, it doesn't matter what the vibes are in the clubhouse. And and it doesn't matter what professional sport it is. You only get good vibes if you win. And and my biggest concern is guys are checked out now. That's what I was going to say. Like The vibes in the clubhouse are not great. You've got guys that have at least allowed for folks to say they don't want to be there, that they want to be moved. You have another guy who says he felt he feels isolated inside of your clubhouse. And I, I'm still not sure that the White Sox have even addressed that yet. And, and so, so to me, like the vibe check, you don't get a pass on that either. No. So, and, and so I'm, I want to try and be fair to Pedro because I do think that he has been handed the bag to use Jim's ter- terminology. But I, I was expecting more considering it seemed like he knew what the problems were. Maybe he just isn't equipped yet as a first-year manager to fix it, or maybe he's not empowered enough. Or he didn't get to hire all of so his that, people. That's what I mean. And, and because you've had so many of these like the the construction of a of a government here of people from various factions and parties placed in his cabinet. Well, he's got his hitting coaches though. 
He, he got those guys. I mean, he is left over with Daryl Boston, which I don't know what Daryl Boston does for the Chicago White Sox. He didn't hire his bench coach. That's true. That's a good point. He did not hire his bench coach. Uh, <laughs> thanks for reminding me because that was a little bit odd. It's I still get a feeling maybe the bench coach was hired before the manager. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and that's, I, I still that's get that your vibe. guy. That that's your Doctor Watson, that, right? That that's your conciliary. Yeah, yeah. It it's not a good situation in the White Sox bench, and I know Rick Hahn hates when people speculate your fall's future. But of course, Rick Hahn is going to defend Pedro Grafal because that's his guy. And that was the whole point in like Jim's column as well, is that Rick Hahn, you finally got your guy. You finally got your interview process. You were so proud because after Tony La Russa had to retire second time in that same press conference, you stated, we have to regain the trust of White Sox fans. And you went through the interview process and you gloated about the process and the end result and how excited you were. And through spring training, trying to hype up Pedro Gafal and how things are going to change. And here we are, man. I, in the next two weeks, I got to speculate who you are trading. And guess what? There's not a single White Sox fan out there that wants you to make these trades because they don't trust you anymore. Like, this is like the worst possible position to be in for a professional sports team where your paying customers don't want you to make moves, but everybody understands you got to make moves because you can't just go through the rest of the season with these guys. And then after the season ends in the 10 day span, you give out qualifying offers that will be clearly declined. And then all you get back is second round comp picks in the MLB draft. Do you think it matters if, if Rick is trade other than the, the fear of injury, if, if Rick is trading guys today versus on July 31st, like does, does the two and a half weeks matter at all? It might matter because of what happened last year in which that the only move that he made was trading Reese McGuire for Jake Diekman. Like he's got to, he's got to get to work. I, it, it says in the intro, Rick Hahn's work is not done. Rick, Rick has got to work. Kenny, I don't know what you do anymore. Kenny Williams needs to get to work. Uh, you had your draft day. You have your scouts. You have your assistants. Let them handle that. You guys need to get on the phone and start working. The fact that Lucas Giolito is not pitching this weekend. And I already know what Pedro Gafal is going to say. Is along the lines tomorrow. Oh, well, we wanted to give Gio extra days off like everybody else got uh, because he pitched the Sunday before the All-Star break. So he'll be fine. He'll be ready to go on Tuesday. And the whole trade speculation, he's here until he's not. But the fact that you're not starting him, your best starting pitcher, against the best team in Major League Baseball, just invite speculation over the next four days. Has Lucas Giolito pitched the last game in a White Sox uniform. I don't know the answer to that, but deadlines clearly do not move Rick Hahn into activity. So I don't think it matters between now and trade deadline if Rick Hahn makes a move. I, I don't think the timing matters, Lawrence. Okay. I was just wondering if there might, if they might get more or if it matters. But it I mean, they could, but if not. the Angels crash, if the Padres crash, then all of a sudden you got Otani. And he got Snell, and I like Giolito, but I'd rather have Otani and Snell if I'm a contending team helping me in October. Like, I'd rather have those two guys. That is part of the risk and the calculation you got to consider as far as timing. I think as Rick Hahn, he's got to have a price tag in mind. He's got to have to have prospects in mind based on the team that's calling on what he's trying to acquire for Giolito.